Hello everyone and welcome to today's TAFE Talks, which is on European skills ecosystems and implications for Australia. My name is Lyndall Manson. I'm the Director of Governance, Policy and Projects for TDA and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. Before I begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet today, all around Australia. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations peoples here with us today. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, which is on the land of the Wurundjeri people. And if you'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which you are currently on, please feel free to do so by telling us in the chat. So today we are turning our attention outside of Australia and we are delighted to be joined by two very knowledgeable presenters from Europe who will be discussing European centres of vocational excellence and skills ecosystems. So just to give you a bit of context on how these TAFE talks came about, this is actually the continuation of a conversation that we started at the TDA convention in November 2022. So at the convention, we played a video presentation from Jao Santos from the European Commission on the European approach to VET. And now we didn't get to play the final part of his presentation, which was on skills ecosystems and centres of vocational excellence. And Jao has subsequently retired. So we decided to make it a topic for one of our TAFE talks so that we could devote a bit more time to exploring the concept. So we are extremely grateful to our speakers today for continuing the conversation with us. And we certainly think that there are some useful lessons from the European approach for Australia. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for today. Firstly, I would like to introduce Hagnil Skalid, who is the seconded national expert, Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion at the European Commission. Hagnil is joining us from Brussels today and will be presenting on the policy framework for the European Skills Agenda. She'll also give us the big picture overview of their centres of vocational excellence and where they are at now with the initiative. So welcome to you, Hagnil. Thank you for joining us. Then we will hear from Baldwin Grieving, who is the Project Manager Internationalisation for Catapult in the Netherlands and the Coordinator of the Centres of Vocational Excellence Community of Practice. Baldwin is joining us, I think, from Utrecht today and will talk in a bit more detail about how the communities of practice are working, how they are facilitating the conversation between the different stakeholders, the types of activities involved, as well as some examples of regional and international skills ecosystems. So welcome to you, Baldwin. And finally, I would like to introduce Jenny Dodd, who is very well known um, to many of you. Jenny is the CEO of TAFE Directors Australia. Jenny will provide us with some reflections at the end uh, on the European approach and lessons for Australia. Jenny's also just going to briefly introduce an upcoming TDA event. So over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Lyndall. And I'd like to also express my thanks to our two speakers today, to Rekna Hill and to Baudavin. We really appreciate you getting up at the crack of dawn to be part of our session today here in Australia. And we look forward to that conversation. Safe talks, as, you, as our participants know, we, we tend to have one each month. Well, the end of May, we have, for the first time, T TDA will be running a pretty uh, significant uh, online conference, which will start at 12 noon on Wednesday, the 31st of May, Australian Eastern Standard Time, going right through to 5 p.m. There are 11 sessions. Our topic is a really important topic. Our topic is, a, is TAFE Open Stores, a focused conversation on access, equity and inclusion. The people who will be speaking are your colleagues and we have presentations from both external speakers, but also from leaders within our TAFEs who are doing really significant pieces of work 
in areas of access, equity and inclusion. So I invite you all to uh, register and there is on your screen a TAFE open store little registration button that you're able to click on and register if you haven't already do, done so. That's enough for the future. Please come in on, the, on Wednesday the 31st of May and, and be part of that. But today, most importantly, let's hear from a global perspective and thank you again to our two guest speakers. Thanks, Jenny. So in terms of the format for today, we are going to hear from all of our speakers first, and then we'll open up the floor at the end for a Q&A session uh, with our participants. You are, of course, welcome to use the chat function for your chat and commentary throughout the session. But if you have any questions for our speakers, it would be appreciated if you could please use the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the screen. And just so that you are all aware, today's session is being recorded and both the recording and the slides used by our presenters today will be made available to everyone who registered for this TAFE Talk session and will also be put up on our TDA website. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our first presenter for today, Hagnil Skalid from the European Commission. Over to you, Hagnil. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'll give a short introduction about the European Erasmus Plus flagship uh, initiative, the Centres of Vocational Excellence and their skills ecosystems. So next, uh, next slide, please. For a bit of context, I will start with a few words about the, some of the relevant policy framework. The European, uh, European pillar of social rights is about better delivering on rights of citizens by building on uh, 20 uh, key principles. Principle number one states that everyone has the right uh, to quality and inclusive education, training and lifelong learning in order to maintain and acquire skills that enable them to participate fully in society and manage successfully transitions in the labor market. Principle number four of the pillar says that everyone has the right to timely and tailor-made uh, assistance to improve employment or self-employment uh, self prospects. This includes the right to receive uh, support for job search, training and requalification. Young people have the right to continued education, apprenticeship, traineeship, or a job offer of good standing within four months of becoming unemployed or leaving education. The European Education Area Initiative uh, covers all levels of education and helps the countries to work together to build more resilient and inclusive education and training systems. The rapid shifts uh, towards a climate neural, uh, neutral Europe and digital transformation is changing the way we work, learn, take part in society and lead our everyday lives. Europe can only grasp these opportunities if its people develop the right skills. Many will need to acquire new skills and move to new jobs in different sectors of economy. More will need to upskill to keep their job in a new work environment. The Euro European skills agenda for sustainable competitiveness, social fairness and resilience from July 2020 is a five year plan to help individuals and businesses develop more and better skills and to put them to use. And as ind industries and occupations change, so too will the needs of employers and the demands put on the workers. High quality vocational education and training has a key role to play, ensuring people have the right skills to tackle social economic challenges and thrive in their personal and professional lives. This applies both to the youth of today, to whom VET provides a smooth pathway into the labor market, uh, and to adults who need to upskill and reskill to adapt to a changing uh, world of work. Next slide, please. The combined effects of rapid technological change, digitalization, climate change, demographic trends, and new forms of work call for innovative ideas to ensure that vocational education and training not only adapts, but is also at the forefront of mastering and driving change. The developments not only affect every aspect of work and life, 
but also create opportunities for innovation and employment creation across all sectors. The capacity to innovate through coordinated efforts by governments and cluster organizations is increasingly becoming the key factor driving economic and social development. VET policymakers are confronted with new challenges in anticipating and responding in due time to fast changing skills needs of the labor market and to the expectations of the individuals. To address these challenges, VET institutions must become more flexible and responsive in updating their offer, including for lifelong learning, while companies have to become an active partner in designing and providing opportunities for work-based learning. Developments in VET systems have often been too slow and in most cases driven top down. The speed and scale of change calls for innovative approaches where VET institutions are empowered to understand, engage and be active partners in co-creating solutions for lo uh, local social and economic development. A bottom up approach where VET institutions are capable of rapidly adapting skills provisions to evolving needs is essential to raise the attractiveness, relevance and quality in VET. The new paradigm for VET institutions is local in its nature, while the challenges they, they are facing are increasingly complex and global. Next slide, please. The European flagship initiative on centers of vocational excellence, so-called COVE, uh, aims to be a driving force for reforms in the vocational and educational training sector. Ensuring high quality skills and competences that lead to quality employment and career long opportunities and meeting the needs of an innovative, inclusive, uh, inclusive and sustainable economy. It is part of the Erasmus Plus program uh, and is closely aligned with the European skills agenda, the European education area and the ambitions for the VET sector as agreed by the EU member states in the Council recommendation on VET for sustainable competitiveness, social fairness and resilience from 2020. The Centres of Vocational Excellence is a fundamental initiative to support the countries, social partners and VET providers in implementing VET excellence. Next slide, please. So our goal is VET excellence meaning innovative and responsive VET institutions that are capable of rapidly adapting their skills provisions to evolving economic and social needs, including the digital and green transitions. We want to get there through funding of and support to international collaborative networks of centers of vocational excellence, which work on two levels. First, at national level, the COVES operate in a local context, closely embedded in the local innovation ecosystems. These bring together a wide range of local partners, such as providers of vocational education and training, employers, research centers, development agencies, employment services, among others, to co-create so-called skills ecosystems that contribute to a regional economic and social development innovation and smart specialization strategies. They aim to provide high quality vocational skills, support entrepreneurial activities, diffusion of innovation and act as knowledge and innovation hubs for companies, particularly SMEs, while working with centers in other countries. And the second is the transnational collaborative networks that share a common interest in and cooperate on specific sectors such as ICT, sustainable energy, agriculture, healthcare, etc. Or they cooperate on innovative approaches to tackle societal challenges such as climate change, digitalization, artificial intelligence, sustainable development goals, integration of migrants upskilling people with low qualifications, etc. Or finally, they cooperate on innovative approaches to increase outreach, quality and effectiveness of existing codes. I know that you're interested in the role of the students. Um, the activities of the codes are learners oriented and the codes refer to their involvement in a variety of their activities. 
The council recommendation on vocational education and training that I mentioned calls for uh, a learner centers approach and also for a governance that involves all stakeholders, including the learners. We, we apply this in our work on that, where the representatives of the learners are always involved. Next slide, please. So where are we now? The concept of centers of vocational excellence was tested in two small scale pilot calls in the previous Erasmus Plus program period. And the initiative is now being fully supported in its current form under the new Erasmus Plus program. The initiative has an indicative budget of 400 million euros to fund 100 codes, uh, code projects in the period 2021 to 2027. These are four year projects and each project can receive up to 4 million euros. Next slide, please. And just to give you an idea of the scope of the initiative, some facts from the 2021 call. We received sorry, uh, 84 applications, whereof 13 were selected for funding. So there's a strong competition. In the selected projects, we have partners from uh, 37 countries involved, which indicates that the initiative reaches well beyond the 27 member states of the European Union. And in all, we see 331 participating uh, organizations in the projects. And this is then only for the very first call of the initiative. Next slide, please. So I've added some links for more information for anyone who wants to uh, dive into the details of this initiative. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much for your attention. Sorry about that. I was just um I just lost my screen completely and, and couldn't take myself on mute off mute. So sorry about that. Thank you so much, um, Hugnian, for your presentation. There was a lot in there that I think is music um to our ears. Um you talked about um in the context of digital and green transitions, the need for vet providers to become more flexible and responsive in updating their offer. You talked about the speed and the scale of change and the need for co-creating solutions um, for local social and economic development and, and the need for a more bottom-up approach. Um, and, and while the context that we're operating in, and this is true for our, our TAFE audience, is sort of local in nature, the challenges that we are facing um, and, and the skills demands and, and, and are increasingly complex and, and global. So, I think there are a lot of things in there that really align with our, our thinking and we really appreciate um, you, you setting out the context, context for us. So um, I'll now introduce our next um, speaker, uh, Baudevin Grevink, um, who is representing Catapult in the Netherlands and is the coordinator of the Centres of Vocational Excellence Community of Practice. So over to you, Baudevin. Well, thank you so much, and uh, well, it's a pleasure being here, and um, so thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, what I will do in the well next 15 minutes or so is uh, to basically show you the, the practical side of uh, the Centers of Vocational Excellence. Uh, like Lyndall mentioned, uh, I'm working in the Netherlands for an organization called Catapult, which is a network of uh, public-private partnerships uh, in education, trying to, well, innovate uh, education. Um, and from the Netherlands, we are involved in uh, a couple of the, the centers of vocational excellence. And uh, I hope in well, the, the next minutes to, to give a, a couple, couple of good examples of how this is actually working, uh, benefiting companies, uh, students uh, and teachers. Next slide, please. Well, right now, just um, well, um, indicated what, what the, the policy uh, looks like and what the policy ambitions are. And I think the, yeah, the, the big question is, um, is it working, this initiative? And next slide. Um, I'm happy to tell you uh, that it is. Uh, we, we currently, including the, uh, the pilot phase, we have uh, 22 centers of vocational excellence running across Europe. 
Um, and uh, these are like the, the transnational um, centers of vocational excellence, but each uh, center of vocational excellence has like multiple regional uh, centers as well. Um, you will get the slides later. And uh, if you just click on the logos that you, uh, you see on this uh, slide, you will go to the websites of each individual uh, center of vocational excellence. So you can have a bit of a look uh, well, what they are doing, what types of activities they're working on, and also in which sector. Um, but I, I will spoil it already for you. Uh, it, it's quite diverse. Some are really uh, working on, well, uh, greening the economy, um, or on agriculture, whereas others are working on uh, the energy transition. So, for instance, the, the T-Shore project is really focusing on uh, the energy transition. We were building like a lot of wind parks in the North Sea. Uh, and then the company said, okay, but who's going to maintain all those uh, wind turbines at sea? Well, that's what this COVID is, uh, is doing. Um, next slide, please. Well, maybe a, a bit more on uh, the community of practice. Uh, one more click, uh, please, Paula. Um, in 2019, and the, the project leaders of these uh, first centers of vocational excellence came together and uh, we felt like, okay, this is a new initiative and it's, well, really something new for us all so we have to uh well be flexible we have to be uh, creative in making these uh, these projects uh, a success i mean the, the european commission very kindly uh, provided us with the means and the incentive to to work together with companies uh, with local governments but how to exactly do this um yeah that's something that was uh, rather new and in this community of practice um the the project leader said, okay, let's get together like once a month um, just with the project leaders ourselves um, to, well, exchange experiences, uh, well, share lessons learned uh, because not everything is going right. Of course, you can make mistakes when you're innovating um, um, well, education. Um, so that's what we've been doing in this community of practice. So it's really uh, for and by the, um, the, the Center for Vocational Excellence project leaders it's a bottom-up initiative um, and also completely voluntary. So we see sometimes project leaders when they are slightly busy that they uh, will um, do not join a couple of meetings, but then later on uh, hop on again, also depending on the topic uh, that was selected by the project leaders to discuss. Um, Technica in uh, the Basque Country and, and Catapult, we uh, well, are taking up the, the facilitation of this uh, community of practice, which basically means that we once a month have like an online meeting like you're having with your, your TAFE talks. Um, but also we try to meet uh, at least once a year uh, face to face to really go more in depth and last year we had the very first forum of vocational excellence in San Sebastian in uh, Spain and uh, in September we will actually uh, will meet again with hopefully with about 400 practitioners policy makers and experts in the field of uh, vet um, to once again exchange experiences and really will help each other to um, well, make as big as an impact as we can. Um, one more click, please. So to summarize, um, our goal is really to, to help each other. It's like a, a peer group. Um, we would like to prevent to reinvent the wheel. And we strongly believe that we are uh, together stronger than we are when we are just trying to implement our COVID by ourselves. Um, so we're finding solutions together, uh, also to, to get a feedback on what's working, for instance. So. Um, in, in Europe, like uh, many national um, a, uh, uh, authorities are actually following the example of the European Commission, investing in these skills ecosystems uh, with national COVI initiatives. And what we're trying to do is to collect basically the things that work and do not work uh, and will provide that information also with uh, like national initiatives. Um, so once again, no one has to reinvent the wheel again. Next slide, please. So how does it work in um, well each center of vocational excellence? Uh, it differs slightly between uh, each project because well uh, depending on the sector or the region, uh, different uh, projects uh, might be necessary. But what we usually see is, is like this um, well loop going on uh, with first the needs analysis, co-creation of solutions between the schools and the companies in the region, uh, the partners. Uh, well, in other countries being used uh, as a uh, source of information or as input, then piloting solutions, and as soon as they work, they will be shared, well, across uh, the, the entire international um, uh, skills ecosystem, but also between uh, centers of vocational excellence. So to give an example of this, in, um, in Denmark, for instance, in the European Platform for Urban Greening, the company indicated, well, we really need to work on uh, biodiversity and we really need to train our 500 workers who are landscapers doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis on 
how to uh, well work more biodiverse and ensure biodiversity. Well, the school said, no problem, we will develop a lifelong learning course for you. Uh, so they just started developing this course and then the school found out, hey, actually we do not have all the knowledge we need uh, on biodiversity to offer this course. So that's when they called the school in the Netherlands who they knew from uh, that they were the experts on biodiversity, got some lecturers over to Denmark to uh, help them develop this course. Then they were uh, piloting the lifelong learning course, which was uh, quite interesting because um, being a school, the schools basically developed a nice course in writing with pictures and that kind of stuff. And then the company said, well, actually, most of our landscapers have landscapers have trouble writing and reading. So can you please make this a podcast so they can actually listen to this lifelong learning course as a podcast in the van uh, when they're going to the job? Um, and to the school, that was also like an eye opener, like, of course, um, this this happens. We, we know these people as well, uh, but they also had to change the way how they deliver their content. So I think that's really nice of this, this co-creation that well, both the company and the schools are benefiting from the, the mutual feedback. And this well, solution, this course has been shared across the European platform for urban greening uh, to other regions now as well. So all uh, regions in, uh, in Europe can benefit. Um, one more click, please. So some lessons learned from uh, well the first four years of working on centers of um, vocational excellence. Uh, well, one, co-ownership is key. Uh, so it is very important that both the companies, the, the government partners and the schools are involved and uh, are also investing in the collaboration. Uh, because we have seen many projects where there's a subsidy in the school saying, okay, well, I will develop something for uh, the, the companies and then and nothing is happening with the results. Uh, that's not the case with the Centers of Vocational Excellence because uh, each center does need uh, to have a business partner and a school partner on board in the project. Otherwise, you don't get the, the, the subsidy. And that really helps in uh, the involvement and the, the warm relations in the skills ecosystem. Well, working on a needs basis is very important. Um, so this is something that a, a lot of um, a lot of time is invested into to see, okay, well, what is actually really needed in, in terms of uh, skills? Sometimes it's technical skills, but quite often also social and professional skills. So um, how to work actually, how to work in like a, a complex environment, how to collaborate with, with different uh, trades than just your own uh, profession. Um, so that, that's something we see popping up quite often. And what we also uh, see is that it really helps to start uh, and start small, just to, well, create these pilots, create uh, the successes, and then uh, build upon that. We, we also know that sometimes there's a tendency to come up with these big plans and grand visions that take like a year to write. And by the time everyone agrees on this vision, um, yeah, the, the reality has changed and you can start all over again. So what we really recommend is like, okay, you know what you're working on, you know what these, these needs are, just start developing activities on this. And also focus on problem solving behavior. So really uh, try to make it work. Uh, we have to well break down silos between companies, schools and governments. And the only th way you can do that is by just well working hands on and trying to solve the issues that you encounter. And another lesson learned, and that's like any good relationship, basically, um, you need to take your time. So uh, the European Commission uh, luckily has decided to uh, fund these projects for four years. And that's also the time that you, you really need to, well, really get to know each other, to build the trust needed, um, to allow each other to, to make some mistakes as well, uh, because companies and schools can speak different languages sometimes, and sometimes it's hard to, to understand, well, why uh, schools are working so slow, um, um, or why uh, companies are behaving the way they are behaving. And it's really important to take time to, to understand each other and to, to really focus on, okay, how can we collaborate that benefits us all? And I think that leaves, us, uh, leaves me to the last lesson uh, learned. And that it's not about increasing your, um, your, share, uh, well, short, your share of the, the, the pie, uh, but it's about, about uh, enlarging the entire pie together. And this is also a question we get quite often, like, okay, why would a company actually join uh, this initiative? Because they have competitors, uh, will they, won't they lose like knowledge or skills uh, to, to their competitors? Um, and if you look at it, that, um, yes, that might happen, uh, but that should not be the focus. The focus should really be like, okay, we are lacking uh, skilled workers. We are lacking, uh, well, the, the, the trainings uh, with the, the right skills. How can we solve this issue together? And if we manage to, well, enlarge the number of people working in the sector or, well, enlarge the, the, the number of people with the right skills, that's uh, what these COVIDs are all about. And we need to do this together. No one can do this alone. 
Um, next slide, please. Well, there's um, yeah, maybe one slide back, just a, a brief mention, um, because I think well, what's also interesting to see is uh, when it comes to the, the collaboration between schools and, uh, and companies, um, quite often people tend to think from, from their own organization uh, about the, these collaborations. And what we've done with the Centers of Vocational Excellence is to uh, create this, um, this handbook, we called it, uh, on how to involve SMEs in uh, the work of the Centers of Vocational Excellence, starting with the uh, motivations of the SMEs. Say, okay, why would you like to collaborate? What is the issue you would like to solve? How much time and money do you have? And what kind of well, activities can you think of? Um, so that's what you will find in this publication. Um, so you can just scan it, or if you get the slides, you can click on uh, the image. Um, next slide, please. Well, the Centers of Vocational Excellence are a, a, a really nice arrangement because it, it allows for a lot of activities or a, little, a lot of types of activities, depending on the needs in the skills ecosystem. Um, so partially it's about teaching uh, and learning, which is, well, typical Erasmus, uh, if I may say so. But what I also really like is that um, the European Commission has also included the cooperation, the partnerships and the governance and funding uh, activities. Because it is really about, well, starting the, these warm networks in the skills ecosystem. And um, by focusing on the co uh, cooperation uh, and partnerships and the governance and funding, you can also really ensure that you can start a movement uh, that goes beyond the project and this is very important in the centers of vocational excellence to make sure that if like the funding ends in, in four years time that we do continue working together and uh, that this subsidy has just been a kickstarter of something great uh, so this is um well what a lot of centers of vocational excellence are focusing on straight from the start to think about okay how can we continue this afterwards next slide please um, well, some examples of the, 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 the regional and international ecosystems. Um, if you look at the 22 uh, current centers of vocational excellence, you see, well, various approaches, again, depending on um, uh, the, the, the topic they are working on. We have a couple of trans, uh, transversal centers of vocational excellence. So, for instance, uh, the GIVE project is focusing on inclusive approaches uh, for VET, really uh, developing uh, trainings and courses for both schools and companies on how to be inclusive as an organization. So how do you train your workers? How do you train your, uh, your teachers uh, in your school, in your company to uh, be inclusive to people uh, who have a distance to the labor market? And how do you make sure that you keep them on board? Uh, with GreenOvet, they are working on, uh, on green skills. So how to green uh, our economy. Um, what, what is very interesting here is that they have uh, well, four different regions across Europe and they're all working on green skills, but they're all different sectors. Uh, so in Portugal, it's a completely different industry sector than in Austria, but what they have in common is like, we need to green our, uh, our industry and how can we do this and try to solve that, uh, that issue together. Uh, one more click, please. Another approach that we see is like a more uh, sectoral um, uh, approach in the Centers of Vocational uh, Excellence with a central platform where uh, well, materials are offered. So for instance, the All View project is focusing on the wood and furniture sector. Um, they have various regions with each their own needs, but what they do share is uh, an online platform where they um, have like digital learning experiences like VR, uh, augmented reality uh, solutions. Uh, and the same goes for, for LCOMP, which is focusing on advanced manufacturing and DHUB, which is focusing on digital services to uh, SMEs. One more click, please. And uh, the third type of um, centers of vocational excellence that we see is like the, the really uh, well sectoral uh, approach. So for instance, the, the T-Shore, uh, the, the European platform for urban greening and Mosaic, which is focusing on the craft sector, uh, where they are developing activities in the own region, uh, but are using like the, the network between uh, the, the regions as uh, well, a, a base of uh, knowledge uh, and also to share uh, best practices. So um, the example I just gave from uh, the biodiversity course is coming from the European platform uh, for urban greening, for instance. Next slide, please. Well, then, um, it's all nice and good to, to well, have these projects, uh, but in the end, it's about students and it's about people. So uh, I wanted to share some examples of, well, how these uh, centers of vocational actions are actually benefiting teachers and, and, and students. Um, in Talent Journey, uh, they, they basically said, OK, well, we're working on the Internet of Things and on digitalization uh, and developments are going so quickly that we cannot well have like the curriculum in the original way, but we should really uh, start working on like a learner 
um, centered uh, approach where, um, well, either the, the lifelong learning person or the, the, the worker is central or the initial student is central. And based on what this person needs, we're going to see, well, what kind of modules can we offer uh, to, uh, well, train this person. Um, they haven't gone as far to uh, well, offer micro credentials for, for each uh, course, but uh, that in the end is the goal actually to really say, okay, let's see how we can break the curriculum up in uh, well different uh, well kinds of blocks basically that people can learn. Um, another example that I'm actually quite proud of, uh, since in, uh, it's in one of the projects that I've been involved in um, in the the, the the water project. Um, then we noticed that students and teachers were saying, okay, well, we see these project managers traveling up and down, but we would like to have this experience as well. And what we've done is to organize like a, a challenge-based learning week of uh, two weeks where companies would provide a challenge for students uh, to work on. Um, students would come together from uh, four to five different countries to work for the very first time in their life in an international team on this challenge. And, and yeah, they, they were uh, taken to all kinds of site visits so they could get an inspiration of, OK, well, where will I uh, work later on, see like the facilities in other countries? And what's really nice about this is that, um, well, it quite often um, uh, allows kids or students who uh, do not have the opportunity to go abroad for half a year, which is like your regular uh, uh, exchange during studies, for whatever reason, they, they cannot do it. But this offers them the opportunity to get this international experience and uh, it's, it's very intensive. Usually they're completely naked after two weeks, but it, it's a great experience for them to uh, well, work internationally, work on a challenge and, um, and really visit the, these companies. And it's been such a success in the water um, uh, center of vocational excellence that the European platform for urban greening copied it and also the, the T-Shore um, Covey on uh, offshore wind. We'll start doing this as well. So this is really focused on um, well the students, and the nice bit is that the companies really love it as well actually because they they get the kids in. They they love to show their work and show the, the latest innovations. Um, another way of how we involve um, students, um, it's uh, was actually an example from from Malta where uh, they have like huge water issues, um, and it's not the most sexy sector to work in uh, on Malta. So both the university and uh, the vet colleges uh, said, okay, well, we need to do something in recruitment in, well, making our sector more attractive. Um, and they organized a, a hackathon together with all the companies on Malta working on water. Um, and it was quite innovative uh, also for Malta where they are well used to like a more classical approach of well presenting uh, companies to students uh, when it comes to recruitment. But in this case, the companies came up with a challenge uh, together. So the students got to work in these multidisciplinary teams with both the university students and vet students to, well, basically um, solve the question, okay, how can we make Malta greener uh, reusing uh, water? And so it was a really nice way of, uh, well, letting students get a feel of, okay, well, what kind of work will I be doing? And also to uh, bridge this rift that sometimes exists between university students and uh, vet students to show like, okay, everyone is needed to solve these issues. So not just the, 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 the bright minds at university, but also the, the bright hands, so to say, um, uh, at the vet school. So you really need this combination of skills. Um, well, the biodiversity course I've mentioned already, so I suggest you to go to the next slide. Um, well, with Erasmus, in at least in, in Europe, quite often the connotation is that it's uh, just about education kind of work and uh, developing courses and that kind of stuff. Um, but with the Centers of Vocational Excellence, you can do a lot more. So you could also work on uh, applied research in VET. And um, I have included a, a small video um, made by uh, the companies of the European Platform for Urban Greening about a, a deep dive they did. And um, if I like, could start the video, then um, you will hear from them. We're taking a deep dive and it's not the kind where you wear swim shorts, but it's every time that the, the companies in EPLOC meet together, we don't have the time to share our nerdy knowledge. So we wanted to go down in detail with the things we did. EPLOC is a network of uh, landscapers throughout Europe. We are participants from six different countries, schools and companies, all sharing ideas of curricula and best practices throughout the countries. EPLUG is setting up a, a European-wide network and we are learning from companies but also from schools from other countries and we are learning how they do things and how we could apply that in our company and in our country as well.
I participated in the deep dive because across Europe there's a lot of uh, expert and a lot of knowledge and when we combine our knowledge we're getting it even better. E-plug is important for two reasons. We have to share knowledge across the countries and across the companies, but we also have to be part of changing the education because we can't keep educating people as we did 20 years ago. If we do that, we won't be able to solve the problems of tomorrow. Catapult is in the European platform for urban greening to really accelerate the working together of these companies and schools and all the other stakeholders. And after a while, the company said, we would like to share more on innovation. We're doing a lot of education, but what about the innovation? So the deep dive is going down to issues and solutions and how we can create and work with them. For me, it's important to participate in uh, ePlug and also in the deep dive because in Leeuwarden we also have the topic of urban and water working together. And in this case we have an opportunity to do it not only on a national scale but also in an international context. We have here wonderful companies and we have wonderful uh, learning institutes and then we are trying here to gather an information what is needed in the future on our sector but also which is really needed in my company. So there are a lot of solutions which need to be implemented and we are here trying to figure out how to get that knowledge and how to get that integration throughout the whole Europe for our sector to build better greener environments in the future. So we'll continue a bit longer, uh, but I, I will leave this as a cliffhanger for you to, to watch afterwards because I don't want to take too much time for, from, from Jenny uh, for her reflections as well. So can we go to the next slide, uh, maybe? Yes, uh, and this is um, basically my final slide, but it's also an invitation to you all to uh, well join us in, in Europe in uh, well the, the work we're doing on uh, vocational uh, education and training. Um, like I mentioned, we, we are meeting again in uh, September in Amsterdam for the, the Forum on Vocational Excellence. If you happen to be around, please join us. Um, but if you uh, prefer to, to join online, that's possible as well. Um, furthermore, um, I have uh, added a QR code, uh, which you can scan to uh, well, find an overview of all current centers of vocational excellence, including the descriptions and their contact details. And I am speaking on behalf of all project leaders that they would be more than happy if you would reach out to them. Um, because, uh, of course, we are learning from each other within Europe, but we also love to, well, include perspectives from, from outside Europe. Um, and also, if you uh, would like to well follow what, what's going on with uh, vocational excellence in Europe, uh, if you follow the hashtags that I've mentioned um, on LinkedIn, you will see uh, well quite a bit of information popping up in your uh, your timeline. Um, and if you have specific questions, or if you feel like okay, I would like to get in touch with a specific Kovi, but I don't know who to look for, uh, please feel free to to drop me an email, and um, I will put you in touch with uh, the, the relevant Center for Vocational Excellence. I would like to leave it at that and thank you so much for uh, your time and attention today. Thank you so much, uh, Baudivin, um, and thanks for giving us a bit more detail about how the, the Centres of Vocational Excellence are, are working in practice and for your invitation to the um, forum in Amsterdam in, in September and online. Um, your presentation has generated uh, a few questions, which is great. So we will come back to those um, at the end after we've heard from Jenny. But if you do want to have a look in the Q&A, um, please um, feel free to do so. So I'd now like to turn to Jenny Jodd, who is going to provide us with some reflections on what you've just heard and perhaps some possible lessons for Australia. So thank you, Jenny. Oh, thank you, Baldwin, and thank you, Ragnald. Uh, that, that, that was absolutely fabulous, and I think you did stimulate a lot of uh, thought, and you can see that in the, there are some questions there. So I'm just going to have a couple of minutes because I think we want to get to some of those questions. First off, I think what really resonated or would have resonated really strongly with our audience is both of you were so clear about the learner-centeredness of the, these initiatives as well as the focus on teaching and learning. And, and I think that that is great. And then you went on, Badovan, to talk about the innovation and the importance of that partnership and innovation. And I think that that, that uh, 
um, process is so important to what we do in Australia, which is similar, but perhaps in uh, perhaps not as well well uh, conceived in terms of the deliberate governance structures that sitting around this that is actually giving it four year timelines to actually, to really develop that thinking and and I think that is something for us and our government policymakers to have some thinking about longer longer lead times in terms of deliberate project constructions. Uh, Rangnell talked about co-create, or you both did really, co-creation, co-ownership. There, there's similar messages that we've been trying to give in Australia about that partnership approach that has collaboration and community, those, those four co's, if you like, all coming together, which is not, that, that is a similar story here. But again, I think that there are some really specific things that your model has to help us in that thinking. You were talking also about the nature of the learner, differences there in how you go about doing what you do. I, I really did like that podcast example that you gave. Sometimes we make all these assumptions, don't we? And then when we get down to uh, really looking at that particular learner cohort's needs, there might be a solution that requires a different delivery methodology to achieve that including the way in which you brought in diversity and inclusion, how that is working in terms of some of these uh, centres of vocational excellence. I thought it was a fabulous presentation from you both. Thank you so much. We, um, I think we learned enormous. We have been strongly pushing from a TAFE Directors Australia point of view that we have to have local solutions because it's in local solutions that those innovations emerge. We're not the environment of Europe, uh, but we are still a federated country which uh, operates a, a very large landmass and operates as a fed federated uh, conglomerate of uh, nine governments, really, six states, two territories and a Commonwealth government. And that governance structure means that there are, is a need for local, but there is also a need for national and there is also a need for those reflections reflections internationally and I think that's what you gave us today you're dealing with a, right across Europe we're dealing with just one country but there's a great need for us to look in those global perspectives so thank you very much I think there was so much we could get from that in terms of uh, centers of vocational excellence I encourage our participants to participate in your invitation Budiman, to be part of these conversations and I'm sure that we will return to you both in time to, to keep this conversation going. I'm gonna hand now for the last 10 minutes to Lyndall to highlight some of those questions and answers and pose them to you from the participants who've, who have put them into the Q&A. Thank you, Jenny. And thanks again to all of our speakers today. We have got a few questions in our Q&A. Uh, so I'll kick off with the first one. Um, the, first, the question is about the approaches to and for equity, uh, especially how gender equity uh, is built into the agenda's skills ecosystem, and if and how consultation and equity policy input happens, and if equity policies are measured, if you have accountability frameworks, and if that they are evaluated. So I'm not sure if, um, Kragnild, if you want to have a go at that one, um, or, or Baudivin, feel free. Well, I can say at least a couple of uh, words from the the, the, the practical side uh, as um, well how well every COVI is actually working uh, on, on this topic. Um, if you look at the the application for the Centers of Vocational Excellence, uh, like equity is one of the issues that everyone has to address uh, in, in well uh, specify how you're going to deal uh, with this topic. Um, so all COVIs are working uh, on this topic uh, to a certain extent. I mean, some COVIs like the, the, the GIFT project that I've mentioned before, they are really about, well, uh, diversity and inclusiveness. That, that's their main focus. So they, they clearly do more on this uh, than some of the other COVIs. Um, but everyone, um, well, has to address this in, in their own sector. And um, yeah. In some cases, it, it works uh, quite well, and people manage uh, to to well um, well get get a like more diverse uh, audience. 
Um, but also, uh, if we're uh, well, very honest, like we, in Europe, we, we have huge issues in uh, attracting more women into uh, STEM subjects or attracting more women into uh, IT. So it, it also really depends on, on the sector, like um, yeah, how well we uh, succeed in uh, well implementing these approaches. And um, yeah, it, it is being monitored. So also in the reporting, we have to indicate uh, as centers of vocational excellence, okay, what we're doing on it, what the success is. Uh, but I, I guess we, we have to wait a little bit longer until like uh, more COVIDs have done their interim reporting and their final reporting to actually be able to say, okay, to, to what extent did we well reach these goals uh, across the board of all COVIDs. So I don't want to invite myself for, for two years time, but maybe then uh, we, we can say a bit more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ragnil, did you have anything to add to that or from a sort of higher level policy perspective? No, I think Baudwein uh, was very, uh, very good at answering this. So no, I don't have anything to add for now. But I see that there are some questions, if I can just, uh, because I see that there is a question about non-European countries in the, yes. uh, in the projects. And uh, I just want to say that, yes, uh, uh, non-European countries can uh, access Erasmus Plus funding uh, as long as they can, uh, that the, uh, the project shows that they, that is kind of, that gives added value and that they actually contribute to the, the, the objectives of the projects. So absolutely it's possible for non-European countries to participate and access the funding. Uh, and that's how we see that it's 37 countries involved. We see also that we have countries outside Europe participating in some of the projects. Please. Um, we have Australia yeah. in there at the moment, is that right? Hmm? We don't have Sorry? Australia in there at the moment. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yes. Perhaps that, that's an invitation. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got another question now, and it's around um, individuals and learners um, being at the centre. So how do you ensure from an overall governance perspective that their voices are heard, listened to and acted upon um, in, in any feedback loops, especially those voices which, you know, aren't often, you know, heard enough? So I'll open that up to, to Baudavin or Hagnil. Well, what, what we do, um, like I think what, what I've mentioned with like the needs analysis being at the very core of, um, well, many of the, the these uh, COVID, that, that's like the, the, the starting point. So that's coming both, uh, well, from, um, well, uh, initial students, but also uh, continuous uh, learning uh, students. So those needs are being put at the very center of, well, okay, what, what's needed? Um, well, we develop the, these activities and uh, also part of each project is like this uh, impact and quality assurance, uh, well, work package as we, we call it. Uh, which ensures like a strategy that uh, after activities, after uh, like also a period of time, it's being checked with the uh, participants in the activities, uh, well, how they evaluate these uh, activities, what could be done better, um, how they appreciate it, uh, etc. So it's actually, um, well, from um, the um, uh, requirements from the, the, the call for proposals or already a requirement to, to have such strategies in the project uh, to ensure this. And how uh, each uh, project exactly does this? Some work with like uh, a board of advisors, others take on like more of like the, these feedback loops in, in the working process. There's differences there, but it has to be uh, part of the project. And um, actually, also, even if it wasn't a project, it should be part of the co-creation. Otherwise, you would feel miserably in uh, delivering your activities. Um, is my personal point of view. Right. Thank you. Uh, Hagnil, did you have anything to add or will I move on to the next question? Yeah, I think we're ready for the next question here. <laughs> cool. um, so we've got a couple of questions um, that came up when you were talking about Iran, about um, when you're talking about, you know, students, um, what, what are the age of the students that you're talking about? Um, is this in schools? Is it post-school institutions? And then related to that, um, is this focused on, when you say focused on skills, is it skill levels, jobs, occupations, accreditation of units, clusters of units? So just a little bit more detail on, on those elements if possible. 
Um, well, it's a very good question. It's also the very first question that the partners within the project ask themselves, who are we actually talking about? Because uh, even within Europe, each country uh, has its own education system. So that's also one of the difficulties sometimes to uh, determine like, okay, who are we talking about here? What kind of level? So uh, luckily there's the European uh, qualification framework that we can use as like a translation tool. Um, and basically uh, all groups that you mentioned uh, can be included in the activities depending on what's necessary in um, well the specific sector of the COVI. So sometimes uh, you see that um, well the schools and the companies actually are working on uh, actually secondary um, um, school activities for instance for recruitment or making uh, certain sectors more attractive uh, to students. Um, sometimes it's really focusing on uh, well, people wanting to change jobs, uh, reskilling and upskilling. Uh, so there will be uh, people in the, the well, basically above 20 who already worked uh, but would like to change or have to to upskill. Um, and when it comes to to um, well, the the initial uh, education, uh, we we see quite often uh, that the activities are focusing on okay, how do, can we update the uh, the curriculum. Uh, quickly enough. So in, in those cases, it's quite often within uh, the framework that's there already in, in the net, uh, or within the, the, the national context and just updating the information saying, okay, for instance, with the, the, the wind turbines, the technical developments there are going so quickly that for the schools, it's practically impossible to have like the latest technological insights uh, in there. And uh, that's where like the, the companies and schools are working together to well update the curriculum constantly um, yeah, to make sure that the students get the, the latest innovations uh, in their training already. Um, and like in, in those cases, uh, the students will get credits and a diploma for it. Uh, but for instance, with the, the International Urban Greening Weeks uh, that, that I've mentioned, that's like more of an extracurricular type of activity. Uh, that's also really focusing on well the so-called um, well professional and soft skills. So uh, working together in international teams, um, well having to present for the first time, which is uh, for, for many students quite a big thing. Um, yeah, and there, there's no credit uh, being uh, put to that, but it's well the experience that we we offer uh, the learners to to, uh, yeah, to to exercise with this and uh, to try this uh, during the, their um, training program already, and not just wait until they get into a professional context and being well um, put out there to, to present or to, to well, work with other disciplines. Thank you. And, and just um, related to that, someone has raised the, um, the concept of micro credentials and asked what, um, you know, what part are micro credentials playing in the um, centers of vocational excellence? Um, I, I would say it's kind of a holy grail. Like a lot of people would like to to work uh, to work towards them, so it's definitely a goal to 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 do this. But again, since uh, all uh, national member states have their different systems and also uh, different accreditation uh, organizations, it, it is something that we're still working on to to get this going. And um, there are pilot projects, there are initiatives, uh, well, to, trying to to achieve this. Um, but yeah, again, um, I don't want to invite myself in two years' time, but uh, we, I think we, we need some more time to uh, to really well show you so, some examples that uh, well have, have proven themselves over a, a longer course of time. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can just time for, for one more. Oh, sorry, you go, Hagnin. No, yeah, if I, if I can add to the last two questions because. Sure. Uh, I think they both uh, go into the core uh, of what this is about, This that we want to have these flexible VET systems that adapts uh, to the needs both of, of the industry and the companies and the labor market and to the needs of the individual. So um, uh, the question of micro-credentials is, of course, also a question of how well, a, a flexible provision that uh, that the students, especially adult students, can do in combination with work. So this whole uh, the whole concept is about kind of answering to the needs of uh, of the labor market and the individuals. So I think this is really at the core of what we're talking about here. 
So thank you very so much. much. And I think I think that's a great way to um, wind up today's session. Thank you again, really, to um, Hagnild, Baldemar and Jenny for your time today and for our um, European colleagues for, for starting very early today to join us um, for our TAFE talks. Uh, it's been a really great session um, and we look forward to seeing everyone again at our um, 31st of May event on access and equity and then our um, subsequent TAFE talk sessions on the 21st of June, which will be on clean energy. So thanks again to everyone and goodbye for now.